Today is my very pleasure to talk to Maris Stromberg. Maris is double Olympian, double Olympic champion 2008 and 2012. Uh, most other notable achievements, two times world champion, one time runner up at the world champs, four times European champ. Welcome, Maris. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good to be here. Nice. I wanted to do that interview actually for a long time and I was hoping we can sit face to face, but the technology makes it possible to talk uh, even across continents. Yeah, all this new technology these days, it's hard to keep up with all this stuff. So, I mean, it's all its all new to me. I'm, uh, I'm more of an old school guy. So, I mean, <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun. It, it's crazy how these days you can connect with the people from all over the world. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, cool. Maris, let's get started. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? My darkest moment? Uh, probably... Well, as a professional athlete, I would probably say 2010 Grands when I crashed at the Grands at the end of the year. I mean, that would kind of, that kind of set me back a little bit and uh, everything was really going, just in, in my career life, everything was just, just going, I mean, perfectly. I mean, until the crash happened. And uh, and what was really the toughest part, because we, we couldn't quite figure out why it happened. You know, it was just such a, such a random uh just a mistake what I made I mean it's just it just came out of nowhere so we I mean still to this day we I don't really know why it happened and uh, but it did happen I guess I mean it, it's really hard to explain so that one's one of those things I think kind of set me back a little bit and in my career a little bit and uh, so there was definitely quite a lot of things to overcome after the crash I just to get back on the bike and then be competitive and, and confident again. Hmm. What did you learn from that moment? Uh, well, it just, you can't take things for granted. I mean, uh, you know, obviously it, I was back then, I think I was 22. I mean, everything was going perfectly. I was going for, I mean, winning all these titles. And I mean, that year I was going for title number four, which was the ABA title. And, um, uh, and you know, as a young kid, you just you just don't you just don't think about any in any circumstance. You just want to go for it and then try to win every every title possible. And uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, I guess I don't know. I I mean, that's one of those things. I mean, still to this day, I mean, I've only seen the video when I crashed I mean, a couple times, and then I still look at it. And I it's I still don't know what went wrong. Yeah, it's just. Uh, yeah, tough one, tough one. And then how, how did you recover from it? I mean, you became a world champion again in the next year. Yeah, I think the, the world... Now, I won 2010 and then uh, I crashed later that year. And then actually when I got back on my bike, I think it was two and a half months later. I really, I mean, I, was, I wasn't able to ride for, I think five and a half, six months, and then I got back on my bike, and two and a half months later, I got second of the Worlds. So, I mean, if you look at the results, I mean, I guess, <laughs> I mean, it, it, the injury wasn't as bad, but it's just the, maybe physically it wasn't as bad as it mentally kind of set me back a little bit, you know, and then, uh, but, uh, yeah, just, uh, what did I learn? I mean, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one. Well, the the recover part, I mean, it was really, why was it tough? Because uh, it was just that, obviously, it was a wrist. I mean, and then when we did the surgery, all that stuff, and then a month later, they discovered there was something wrong with the shoulder as well. We had to get a surgery. And then at that point, I was like, oh, no, you know, because it took a, the whole month just to figure out what was wrong with the so shoulder. And I thought, you know, the shoulder is going to set me back even longer. But but the shoulder actually it healed way before my, my wrist and hand healed. And uh, I remember I still to this day, I mean, I had to wear a cast for two months, went to the doctor, they took the cast off and uh, I started physical therapy and all that stuff to, to get the range of motion back in my wrist. And, and uh, I, went to back, I went back to the doctor, you know, for a checkup. So that's three months later and he's like, it's still not healed. So they put a cast on for another month. So at that point I was like, you know, 
I mean, that's already, I mean, looking by the time you get the cast up, it's going to be four months. And, uh, and I mean, that's a long time, you know, as a, for a 23 year old kid that all he wants to do is just ride his bike. I mean, uh, that was tough. Yeah. And then I think at that moment when they put the cast on, then, uh, my physical therapist from Latvia actually flew to, flew to America. He stayed with me to to work with me and just make sure I do all the right stuff. And uh, and then uh, by the time it was time to go back to doctors for another checkup, but to see if I can take the cast off. And then we took an X-ray, and he said it was it was uh, almost healed. And they said it's it's pretty much good to go. Yeah, but uh, it still took me it took me a while. I mean, I would say probably another three weeks. So I was able to just get back on my bike, and then the first couple. Obviously, a couple of weeks, I was barely able to hold hold on to my handlebar, really, and I had to really tape my my hand and wrist to just to be able to ride. And uh, I still remember those first couple gait gate practices uh, after the injury where I was just, uh, I was slow. I was like, is, am I ever going to get it back? You know, you're always worrying, you know, you, when you get in the gate, you just want to, you want to be competitive right away. But, you know, you got to understand it's going to take time, but uh you're doing gates with you know some of the guys that you used to be easily and now you just can barely hang in there with them. It's like, what happened? It's like, am I ever gonna be you know the same old Marius again? And then all those doubts you know kind of creep in and you think about it. But uh, but uh, you know it, that's why I have my coach, obviously my my physical therapist and then a coach. He's a good. He's not just a good uh, coach, but also the the he's good with the mental part as well to. And then it really helped me to get back on my bike. And uh, I mean, three months later, yeah, I was runner up for the world title, I guess. So it it, it kind of it, it worked out. I mean, the, all the hard work I put in in those three months and uh, they helped me get back on the back on the bike and get in contention again. Mm, nice. And your coach, what did he do to keep you on track mentally? Well, it's just. Uh, Well, coach, I mean, he's always, we always had a good relationship. He's, like I always say, he's been like my second dad, you know, and then I always had full trust in him and, uh, you know, and then whatever decision he made or what, what, you know, whatever training program he came up with or this whatever, that was, you know, as a trainer, you always got to make, make it interesting, got to make something new to, to keep the athlete, uh, keep it going and keep it fun and then, And, you know, there's some decisions he made at first. I was like, I don't, you know, I was like, I don't think, you know, thinking like him, I don't think this is a good idea. But, you know, he was one of the, the people and, and um, that I really trusted and whatever idea or plan he came up with, I was, I was all in. And I think that also helped me to get back on track faster than, uh, than I thought I could be back mm -hmm. on the track. And uh, so, yeah, he's, he's, you know, he has different, different kind of, approaches and techniques and then sometimes you might think it's it's crazy hey man it's just not gonna work but you know it, he's he, you know he, he always proves me wrong he always he, he has always proved me wrong i mean trust me so many times he's come up with the uh, plans or training camps or uh, training sessions that i was like or like even the the little uh The workout, you know, I was like, this is impossible. You know, when I tell him at first, when he tells me what we have to do, it's like, this is impossible. And then, hey, and then two, three weeks later, we figured it out, and it's like, okay, coach, I was wrong. You know, he proved, you know, he, and he kept proving me wrong so many times. So, I mean, is that's why I say he's one of the guys that I really trusted, and whatever he came up with, I was always, I was always all in. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm not sure whether it was really a dark moment for you, but let's talk about your or i would i would like to ask you your rio 2016 experience you put your foot down at the Papendal world cup you won the Papendal world cup and a few people thought like oh he might be going for a third gold medal yeah But then in rio you went out in the quarters i think yeah 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 that's what happened <laughs> well you know it's just to be honest um I thought, I mean, physically I felt fine and I thought I can definitely pull it off and make it happen again. And, uh, I mean, deep down, I really, I really did believe I'm going to go out there and, and win again. I mean, that's how, that's how confident I was, but, uh, 
for Rio, I mean, you know, obviously the race was over. I mean, I had I said some things about the track and all that stuff, and I think it, it definitely wasn't the most perfect track for Olympics. I mean, uh, in my opinion, I was more prepared for something like Papandal type where you can just get drops and you can just open up, you know, you just, just, just let it all out. And that's what I was kind of more prepared for. And the, unfortunately the track, I mean, uh, you know, I always say if I was 25, I probably would have figured it out. But at 29, uh, yeah, the first trade was just too small for me. I mean, I, like I said, the, the second jump, I mean, even three, four months before Olympics, I, I told, I, I let the guys know it's, it's just too small for the speed to be going and everything. And, mm. And when I showed up to Olympics and I saw it's still the same, I mean, really, I mean, on the quarterfinal day, when I showed up at the track, I already knew it's, I mean, this is over for me. It's not going to happen because I, I was only able to go 100% to the third jump. And then obviously I got to tap my brakes and find a way to get over the second jump. And if you can't go full speed, then I just, that's not what I was prepared for. Yeah. I mean, it, it you know, it, it sucks. It is what it is, but, uh, it just wasn't meant to be, but as far as physically, you know, I'm, I know I put all the work in, I mean, the, the times and gates and as far as the, the shape and the, just the mental approach and where I was at that time, I mean, I was ready to go and then three P. Yeah. And then mm. it's just, and that's what kind of kept me in the sport after Olympics a little bit, because I thought maybe I'll give it another go in Tokyo, but, uh, yeah, just uh, you know, they even even the last couple of years before the Rio de Janeiro was kind of, I wouldn't say I was struggling, but there was mentally that those little things that I had to fight and overcome just in in just regular practices. I mean, I was always struggling with uh, some of the just to, to get those couple cranks in, in between jumps or on the bottom of the starting hill, because and that's part of the reason why that all started is because of 2010 crash. Because what happened when I crashed is I, I over pedal, I pedal too far and jumped with the wrong foot. And I think it kind of deep down mentally kind of, that's why I said it kind of set me back. And as you get older, it's it's a lot harder to overcome those things. And I was, I was struggling when we had a lot of super sessions and training camps where I was just, just mentally struggling, just being able to, to do the most basic things, you know, and, uh, so that's why I say it was definitely a challenge, but I mean, I fought through it. I mean, I made it, I made it work. I made it happen. I still went out there and won a one bunch of races and, uh, but, uh, yeah. And then I put all the work in and then to get myself ready mentally and physically for the Rio Olympics. It's just when I showed up and I saw the track, I mean, especially the first, first straight away, just I, I knew it's not going to happen as far as the track itself. I think it's actually the perfect track for me. The first trade was better because the rest of the track was, I mean, it was kind of tricky, but it also was very hard to pass. If you don't make any mistakes, I knew if I could get the whole shit in the, the first trade was more mellow. I mean, that would have been a perfect, perfect mm -hmm. track for me, actually. Okay. It's just the second jump really kind of screwed it, screwed it over a little bit. But, uh, you know, there's no regrets, you know. As long as I know I put all the work, all the hard work in and I prepare myself, I mean, to my best abilities, I mean, I can walk away, I mean, happy, really. Mm, that's good. Well, what's your best moment? Best moment in my career? Yep. Mm, London Olympics. Because, uh, like I always say, it's a lot, it's a lot harder to, to defend your title than to win the first one. Yeah. Uh, that's why I always say it was definitely the the toughest races that I've raced in just mentally. You know, when you when you win Olympic gold and then those four years just, just they just fly by and there's another Olympics. It's like your gold medal is on the line, you know. And and you like and knowing BMX how BMX is you basically you gotta have a perfect race to be able to win to win, you know, to win the to win another title or any or, or you know any title or gold medal or whatever but uh and i just uh physically i was ready but mentally i was like it just i felt like the olympics came too soon it's like my my olympic medals on the line and what if i don't win again you know i was like and then it's just it was tough i mean i was even struggling in uh in 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 in, in, in training in the 
like month leading up to Olympics, you know, like in just a regular track session, we had to do laps. I was struggling because what I was thinking is all this hard work. I mean, let's say, I mean, and if I, if I crash now or, you know, whatever, get injured now, I can't go to the Olympics and defend my gold medal, you know. And if you're thinking about it, you can't give it 100% in, you know, in the in, in training sessions. And that was kind of my mind is like, you know, I don't want to get hurt. Or I don't want some stupid to happen because I want to be I want to be healthy. I want to show up and be able to compete for another gold medal. And that was kind of so that was kind of the, at that time it was really the toughest thing to overcome leading up to London Olympic Games. And uh, and as you know, even in practice, I mean, I was struggling, but it was it wasn't it, it was nothing to do physically. I mean, physically I was ready. I mean, I was I was good to go. It's just just mentally. I mean, I was making all these mistakes. I mean even in practice or the race, I mean, hit the gate, the next gate late. I mean, just, you know, just, just wasn't, just wasn't, my body wasn't loose enough. It's just my mental, the nerves kind of took over a little bit and I just wasn't feeling like myself. I felt like a, like almost like a caged animal, really. I mean, and then, but you know, just slowly, slowly, I mean, I, I found a way, I mean, and then, like I said, I mean, the, the third semifinal, I kind of got that feel back who I am and what I can do and then it's just the main event it's just it just clicked at the right time really I mean I you know like the main event's always been kind of my my uh specialty I mean that's when I kind of you know get myself ready and give it all I got and then it just worked out perfectly hmm. I've written down for a later point but it fits in perfectly here I've in two interviews of you or listen to it and you describe that feeling before the olympic final that you feel like a surfer who's catching the wave and yeah yeah yeah. Always. you feel I mean, the moment the final but uh, just any race i mean how i always look at it i like, compared to the surfing yeah it's uh it's always hard to get on that you know to catch the wave that once you get on that board and and stand up and catch the wave it just it just flows yeah you know and then and that's an Olympic game. I mean, that's how London really was. I was kind of struggling, really. You're waiting for the wave, and then you, you jump on your surfboard, and you just, just fall fall back down. You know, you just you couldn't quite find the balance. And then I think the third uh, semifinal, when I think I actually got second, but I had a good gate, and then I had a, pretty much a whole shot, but I think I ended up with a second. And that's when I kind of got on the surfboard, find the balance, and just got, caught that wave, you know, and then got it going. And... And right when I finished the lap, I just, I just had this like the boost of confidence that I, you know, I, I got this. And then, mm. and, and, and this is, I mean, this is a true story. I mean, my coach's assistant too. I mean, going up to the final before the, before the big final, going up to the starting field, uh, he was, you know, the, he was looking at me. He's like, "Why smiling?" He's like, and I, I told him, man, I, I got this." <laughs> mm. Before the final, he's like, <laughs> he, he, he literally asked me, "He's like, hey, why smiling?" <laughs> He's like, man, I got this. Watch. And then I went up there and then did my thing, yeah. At the best gate of the yeah. of the whole weekend, probably the, even all training sessions. And uh, at a, I mean, obviously, I had a couple of little mistakes and throughout the lap, which is which is understandable. I mean, it's Olympic Games, but uh, but the perfect straightaway was, yeah. I mean, the first straightaway was pretty much perfect. Yeah, I couldn't have done it any better. And that feeling of kit the wave you think you can reproduce it or it just happens uh it he has to it's one of those things it has to happen naturally you know there's be so many races uh where i show up and it you know we all have those days where you're just not feeling it you know it's just not clicking and you're trying to find way you try to fight it but it it just it's just not happening you know and then and uh It just kind of has to happen naturally, really. I mean, um, but uh, but it also, I mean, it 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 comes with a. You have to be able to to fall back on something, and then obviously, what what helps you to get on that catch the wave is obviously you got to rely on all the hard work you put in. That gives you that extra confidence that you know you're gonna catch the wave at the the right time and right moment. And uh, at the end of the day, it's really, I mean, it's. It's all the hours, all the hard work you put in in the in the gym, sprints, track, and then just just the mentally just preparing yourself and getting to the point where you can go out there and and compete for the win. I mean, and then so there's really no no 
you know, magic words or, I mean, how to get on that, catch the wave. I mean, everyone, everyone's different. Everyone has a different approach. But uh, for me, it was always, uh, well, obviously, obviously you got to be confident. But the confidence is, uh, you don't want to be overly confident because that comes out as uh, almost cocky, you know. And then I always had to, as an athlete, you have to find the right balance between, you know, being confident and overly confident. And, uh, and sometimes, I mean, struggling with confidence, there's really three things. I mean, so you gotta, gotta have the right balance. And, uh, but you know, we are not late. It's our job and it's our job to figure it out. You know, there is no, sometimes there's nothing coach can say. I mean, uh, there's nothing that the, the psychologist can tell you, but, uh, you just got to get out there and figure it out yourself. I mean, like I always say, I mean, that's our job. That's what we get paid to do. I mean, and sometimes you just got to do it yourself. I mean, you can't just rely on other people all the time, but they're going to come in and tell you the right things and motivate you. Sometimes it just, it's on you. I mean, it has to come from you, you know, as an athlete. And that's what I always believed in. Hmm. If you could go back in time 10 or 15 years, what advice would you give your younger you? 10, 15, uh, let me think, let me think. Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't, you know, it's, if I look back at my younger years in elite, I mean, I was always a very focused, motivated kid. I never quite, I mean, I was don't earth I, I never try to like overdo it but i was always a hard hard working kid and and uh i think for later in my career what i would tell myself i mean if i could over redo it i mean some of the races and uh some of the stuff is just that things are a lot more simple than they they you know you think they are we tend to complicate them too much a lot of times you know when things are not going away we try to look for all these solutions and then try to make things too complicated that they actually, the solution a lot of times is it's very simple. I mean, and it's right in front of our eyes that we just don't see, but, uh, but you know, like I said, it's one of those things that's easier said than done. And then when you're in the moment and when you're struggling, you know, with something or, you know, winning races or, you know, you're not going as fast as you would like to go. I mean, It's just a natural thing to do is just to overthink, you know, overthink. And, and a lot of times that sets you back even more. I mean, uh, and probably that would, uh, you know, maybe the last, uh, I would say, yeah, last three, four years, if, you know, if could, could kind of have, get a redo over, I would probably, I would approach some things a lot more with a more clear mind and a lot more, you know, was the right word uh, just just more simple approach really yeah because I think I, I did uh, overthink a lot of things and then that was the reason why I was struggling with some of the the most basic things I mean that, that a lot of times you don't even think when you train and I was actually just just overthinking that stuff and I just you know but again I mean it, it's a we are athletes man we gotta we gotta find ways to figure it out and that's the And that's what we have to deal with. I mean, as an athlete, you know, it's not always going to be nice and perfect and got to find ways, I mean, to get out of that hole whenever things are not going great. No. Yeah. And um, again, in another interview, I saw you said, um, you saw in the newspaper, I think, um, that BMX will be Olympic. Uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, you thought like that's cool there will be a gold medalist in BMX but back then you didn't think it could be you yeah. and I thought my math that must have been somewhere around 2001 when did you think you could be I it? Think what I... say again what was the finish the question what was the... the question is you said it could not you didn't think it could be you yeah. the Olympic champion mm -hmm. and then that must have been around 2001 But when did you believe or think you could be the Olympic champion mm. leading up to Beijing, somewhere between 2001 and 2008? Yeah, well, it was probably, yeah, I was, uh, I think I was maybe 14 or 13, 14 when I read that in newspaper. I still remember to this day, I was on my, my dad's, uh, the work. He yeah. used to own uh, 
a shop and I, I I picked up the newspaper and then I read it. I was like, that's that's so cool. I mean, someone's gonna go and you know go for the medal. At that time, I even though I loved BMX and I was I was pretty good at it even as a kid. I never thought you know it's just gonna be me in, in whatever six seven years. And uh, but I think when it kind of really kicked in, I mean. To be honest, it was when it really, really kicked in that I can win. It was probably two thousand and eight. That was year itself. Yeah, but I, I mean, I finished. Uh, I finished high school. I mean, that was. I think that was two thousand. That was two years before Olympics, and then I started college. But that's when kind of qualification started for Olympics. And I left the college so I can just focus on BMX and try to make Olympic team. You know, just to. That that even at that point two years before it was the goal was just to, to race, have fun, and then get as many points and just be able to go to Olympics. And uh, and even two thousand and eight, I mean, I was I was I, mean, I won the European title, and then I won the world title. And then after I won the world title, I still remember to this day. I mean, back then, sitting at home and I mean sitting on the on stairs outside. I mean, one of my buddies asked, "Is like, hey, but have you thought about it? I mean." you won it all this year, you can win Olympics too. You know, and that was, I mean, we, we're talking about like two and a half months before Olympics and I was like, I know, you know, and that's when I kind of really started realizing, I mean, you know, like, oh shit, I mean, you know, I can, it can happen because, because why actually that, why the ner why I wasn't nervous about Olympics that year because the qualification was still going on and I was so focused and, just going out there and trying to win the European title, which I won. Then the next focus shifts to the world title. And once I won the world title, I was like, okay, the world title is over. I mean, the world championship is over. Like, what next? It's, it's Olympics. And that's when you, those two and a half months, you start focusing and thinking about Olympics. And and like I said, I realized, yeah, I just, I, I pretty much have won the whole thing. I mean, this season and the next thing is Olympics. And it's like, I, I think I can do it. And that's when it really kicked in, and then that's why I always say, I mean, it's never easy to win. But if you if I have to compare Beijing to London, I mean, the the approach and nerves and the stress that went in, I mean, the amount of the stress when kind of in preparing for the both games, I mean, Beijing is not even close to London yet, because I was one of the youngest kids in in Beijing, and it was just, I mean, it was just all fun, man. It was everything was new. I mean, I was one of the youngest kids, even though I was still one of the favorites but uh i think a lot of people didn't expect me to win because you know young kid a new experience olympics is probably gonna fall apart and i can handle the pressure and uh it, it just kind of i mean they freed myself i mean really i mean and i just felt i mean i just felt good out there felt good confident and really not much stress yeah not much that not much not that much pressure yeah hmm. okay cool what are the habits that make you a successful person or athlete? The habits? Your habits? Uh, well, I always I always mention three things. Uh, what at least, if I look back on my career, what, what helped me get to the, to achieve what I achieved is a belief, which means you got to believe in yourself. I mean, that you can be the best. And, uh, the second thing is work ethic. I mean, you got to work hard. I mean, uh, which includes eating healthy. I mean, always showing up on time. I mean, not skipping any training sessions, not taking any shortcuts, They're doing putting extra work in. And, uh, and the third thing is surround yourself with good people. You know, you got to have a, hmm. got to get, I always say it has to be a small group of people. I mean, it can be coach or parents, some of your good friends that are just good people that there's a good vibe going on. They always, the people that support you and they want you to succeed, you know, and I think as a, for a young kid, that's, that's very important hmm. to have the, the right group of people, you know, around you. I mean, to kind of that push you in, in the right direction and give you all the right tools to succeed and that. Uh, so I really do believe those three things yeah, would be the, the key, especially for the younger upcoming athletes. Yeah, You know, when mm -hmm. you're more established, I mean, it's, it might change or whatsoever, but uh, 
for an upcoming athlete. I think those are very important things. And uh, for me, yeah, the training, like the training part was training part was never a problem. I was I was always a work. I mean, I was a hard worker when I was a kid. I mean, I always used to overdo things, you know, just to just to get that extra extra work in. And then it was just even in high school. I mean, I used to just. I mean, because uh, I used to live right by the school. I mean, literally a min- one minute walk away, and then I used to just run away from some of the lessons and just go home, and then put some clothes on real quick. Just when it was, I think, winter time, either like I got on the mountain bike or, or just put my running shoes on and went for a quick run, and then back home and didn't even take a shower and just show up at the next lesson all like thick and sweaty and you know and all that stuff. So I mean, that's how I mean, that's how willing I was to to put all the necessary work in. I mean, the, you know, the, I did whatever, it, whatever, I mean, it, it took, I mean, and I was really motivated and just to, at that time, not really thinking about Olympic, just to be the best version of myself and then give myself the best chance to, to compete with all the older guys at that time, which was Madison's, it was Ivo Lacuch, you know, I was kind of like the third guy in line and then, and, and those guys kind of were pushing me and I wanted to catch them and then and, and try to be closer, 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 try to beat them and then till it eventually happened, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. And then also in, in, I think the same interview I mentioned before, you, you said hmm. it all starts with picturing yourself in that position, then the dream can become true. Is that mm-hmm. kind of a visualization thing? Well, it, it 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 definitely does help. It definitely does help, and you gotta you gotta see yourself in that on the kind of visualize. You gotta see yourself on the top of the podium, you know, and then and uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, everyone's approach is different. But uh, if you're afraid of the moment. And you, you, you know, you, then you probably not going to get there. You know, you gotta, you gotta embrace the moment. You, you gotta visualize, you gotta see yourself where you want to get eventually and, uh, and gotta work towards that goal. I mean, uh, there's no way around it really. I mean, uh, and, uh, I mean, even, you know, for myself, I mean, throughout my career, I never really watched videos of myself i never like when even when i won the race i never like going home and watching the the videos of myself racing it's just i go home it's just the race is over either i won or i didn't win i move on i get back back to my training routine and but then i i think before london actually coach i mean i remember he told me he's like you know i want you to go on youtube whatever and just watch some of your best races it's just kind of like to really, I mean, remind yourself who you are, what you're capable of, and then and, and what you can do. And I think that kind of helped me as well because I always, it was always like my job, you know, to get out, you just try to win, make some money, you move on, you know. And then, but then it just, I think it, it, it really helped me. I mean, before London as well, it's just uh, kind of watching all those videos and the, the titles I won and the, the races I won. And then, you know, the kind of, Give me that extra confidence that actually you know i'm a i'm a pretty decent writer you know <laughs> i can that i think i can i can do this again and then you know and and it worked out it worked out hmm. cool do you have a morning routine uh well right now since i'm retired it's <laughs> there's really no routine just change my son's diaper i guess <laughs> but uh well, obviously, we probably talking when I was racing, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was nothing crazy. I mean, uh, when I moved to America, I mean, I usually, I, I got, I got to remember, I would get up at eight o'clock. I mean, the same. I mean, same old, as an athlete, just get up and then grab your phone, check your social media, eat some oatmeal, <laughs> you know, and then, then just. Just, just hang. I mean, just chill at home, and then just get ready for the the morning workout. Really, I mean, that's 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 just what it was. Yeah, really. I mean, it's and uh, as Bob says, I got older. I I started getting up getting up a little bit earlier. Not nothing like six o'clock or nothing crazy like that. But it was just maybe from eight o'clock. It just went when I went down like seven o'clock. I used to get up and stuff like that. But uh, but. Yeah, the morning routine is pretty simple. Yeah, it's just 
just the same old. I mean, there's nothing, nothing specific really. Yeah, I mean, uh, and then just eat, rest, and then just kind of, you know, try to get your body. I mean, just mentally. I mean, get ready for the the day and just the morning workout because they never, they were never easy. Yeah, mm. <laughs> so I mean, you kind of had to make sure you get a good sleep in, you know, and I think as I get older, I mean, that's what I kind of realized more and more that uh, you can't cheat on sleep. Yeah. You know, you just, you, you got to get those uh, good solid, I mean, uh, seven, eight hours in, I mean, to, to give your body, I mean, the best, I mean, best chance of just recovering and getting ready for the, you know, next day. Cause I mean, they, I mean, those gym workouts, they were never easy. And, and most of the time I always, I, I lifted by myself. I mean, since I was here most of the time by myself and then, and it's tough. I mean, it, there were times and it was tough when, you know, when you would buddy, when you, someone's staying with you, you know, days you get lazy, your body kind of pushes you a little bit. It's like, come on, you know, let's go, let's go do this. But when you, when you're on your own and you got to do everything by yourself and find ways to motivate yourself, I mean, it, it got, it got tough towards the end of my career, but I always find, always found ways to get it done and, and never skip any training sessions. So I mean that that was not that was never an issue with me. Yeah. I mean if I had to get stuff done, I got it done, no matter no matter how. But I always got it done, and I always mm -hmm. made sure I put the extra put the extra work in if if I had to. How did you prepare for important moments? Important moments. Um, yeah, everyone. Uh, I, I mean, you just gotta try to. To me, just try to stay calm. Really, I mean, uh, if you, if there's a big race coming up, and um, or I always been a very like a uh, very calm uh, person. I mean, if you can say that, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's always. I think it's just uh, I always been calm and I always relied on uh, all the hard work I put in. That kind of that gave me the confidence going into a big race. You know that. Uh, you know, that everything's going to be fine, you know, and then just do your thing. And I mean, and everything's going to be fine. And then, but there's no specific preparation, really. I mean, uh, just everyone has to find that approach or works, it works for themselves. And obviously be going into before going into big races, I mean, uh, a lot of times and kind of nerves kind of they kind of want to take over a little bit you know kind of not feeling you know like yourself a little bit you get on the bike in the training session you know before the race you just just you're not you're not just not feeling right you just don't not feel you don't feel your bike as good as you should and but uh but uh you know it just for me it always that's just how i always felt i mean going into big race i mean the friday session is always like you just you just can't quite get going. You do gates. You just, just and nothing's clicking. You know, you get beaten by guys that you shouldn't, that you, you shouldn't be beaten by. And then, but it's just that you got, you know, the, the session's over, and the next day gets better. And by the the final day, I mean, you kind of like you feel like yourself again. And that, that's kind of that. That's how I usually. That's how it felt for me, at least, the most of the times. I mean, it took me time to kind of get going, but once I got going, and it just the, the confidence was. I mean, and. Um, you know, and the at the highest peak on the on the final day always. So I kind of kind of pace myself. I mean, really. I mean, and, and that's how we always. I mean, we always train kind of that way too. It's just uh, you start with the. It's just like almost in a gym. You start with the lighter weight, and then obviously you build that build up all the way to till you get to the the max. And that's just. I mean, that's how a lot of times my races went too. I mean, the first motto is just easy, easy, and then you just gets better 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 and by the by the final i'm in, in my my best peak and then just my best uh just mentally and physically i feel like you know i'm just this is it i'm ready to the whole shot now did you deliberately pace yourself in earlier races well not a, maybe not on purpose but it's just uh it just kind of happens naturally a lot of times you know it's just when you when you got a super cross race and when you, you know, it's just when, obviously there's, if you get a 1-8 final with the, you know, the 3-5, whatever, I mean, top guys, then you know, there's no pacing yourself. So there are races when you got to be ready from the, from the very first lap and just go all out basically. And, uh, 
but a lot of World Cups, yeah, I just kind of, the first is just the first, the models, you just kind of, you don't think about it, but you don't, you try to pace yourself. You don't go the first model, you don't try to go like 100% out all the way to the finish line. And then you got to find that rhythm. You kind of, you know, the kind of like you pace yourself and just, just kind of feel out the competition a little bit as well. And then, and then slowly each lap, you try to, you know, add some things, add some things. And obviously by the, the quarter semifinal, that's when you kind of, there's no no feeling out anymore. You got to go all out. Yeah, you just, I mean, you got to get the job done. But uh, but a lot of times the 1A finals is kind of like, yeah, it, it's just, you still, I mean, you you understand you got to have a good gait and all this stuff. You got to have the right focus. But uh, but deep down, you kind of know it's it's not the final yet. So you got to save the, those two, whatever, three, five percent for the, you know, the, the quarter, semi and final. So it just, I just, I just, I don't, it's just how I always was. Yeah, I couldn't kind of give 100% from the first, very first motto. Yeah, because I mean, when I knew when I, when I have a long day ahead of me, I got to save something for the, for the, you know, the big moments. And uh, that's just how it's always been. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, but again, everyone's different. You know, everyone's different. Everyone has a different approach. And then, I mean, I'm sure a lot of athletes would say, you know, you know, their approach, that their approach was different. But that's just how I, always felt yeah and before the olympic finals what did you do before olympics finals uh like in actual race day in terms of preparation uh, yeah i was just uh i was pretty calm i mean uh, yes it's it's really tough to explain i mean uh i mean they're you know, you got to find your own routine, what works for you. But, uh, I mean, there's there's been a lot of races. I mean, I remember when I won the Worlds in in, in China, I mean, uh, 2008 before Olympics. I mean, before the final, I was going up to the starting hill. I was, I was drinking a bottle of, of Coke, you know, soda. So it just, it's not because, I mean, I mean, obviously Coke, I mean, it, it, it's it's just a Coca-Cola, a little bit of sugar. It's it, There's nothing bad. I mean, you can have it throughout the race, but... Uh, But, you know, everyone else is kind of looking at me. He's like, what is he doing? But it just kind of helped me. I mean, it was gave me that a, li a little bit of the swag, you know, like it, this is something different that normally people don't do. And it's like, I'm just chilling there, drinking soda before the final. Everyone else like, what the heck is going on, you know? But it just gave me that, yeah, like I said, the, the swag almost like a little, you know, like, you know, I'm just, that's how confident I am. You know, I can do whatever I want. And then I know I'm going to go out there and perform and then, uh, But obviously, before uh, before London, yeah, and then Beijing, there was no no soda drinking before the final. But uh, you just really, yeah, just really sit down. I mean, I never really listened to music that much throughout the race, so I just sat down. I mean, even we probably even me and my coach we had we joked around a little bit, and uh, and then uh, they kind of gave me my space, and then, then you know just uh, just sit there and kind of like in in a little quiet area and just, just kind of prepare myself. And then, and then, then that's pretty much it. Yeah. There's no, I mean, at that time, I mean, from the semifinal to final, there's really what, like 15 minutes. I mean, there's not much, that much, there's not much you can change really. I mean, it's just either you have it or you don't, you know, at that point. And, uh, I, I had, I got the confidence boost in the last semifinal and, uh, I was just sitting there relaxed and just kind of waiting for that, that the moment. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think I just, everything clicked at the right time and I was ready. I was ready. Mm. Cool. How do you overcome setbacks? Coach, obviously that's why it, it goes back to coach. I mean, uh, obviously there's always been setbacks. There was, I had actually a lot of setbacks 2012 before Olympics. And then uh, that year I was getting sick a lot, you know, I was, showing up to races and feeling great. I mean, and then, bam, I get sick, you know, racing with the temperature, I race the worlds with the temperature, I race the many nationals with the temperature. I still won, though. I mean, quite a lot of races racing sick, but uh, but it takes a lot, a lot of energy, a lot of, uh, just just a lot out of you. And then and the more you do it, I mean, the harder it is to your body to recover, I mean, in, in the long run. And... Uh, And I was struggling, I mean, and then obviously the, the coach was like, okay, this is it. I mean, we can't, 
this can't happen anymore. So he flew out to America, you know, it's like, and then to get me back on track. And then, and I always left, I, I, I left that up to my coach. You know, I, you know, I, I told him how I feel or the things are not going good or just this is not working right now and that. And then I let him come up with a plan and uh, a lot of plans he came up with. I wasn't a fan of, you know, I, I, at first I thought, you know, this is too much. I don't like it. It's, you know, I don't want to leave the house. I don't want to go somewhere for two months now, go away from the home for, for two months. And we had some arguments, but obviously, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I trusted him 100%. And then whatever he told me to do, I mean, I did it. And, and he paid off, you know, he paid off. Trust me, there'd be so many times. I mean, it's like, well, you know, you, you live in your comfort zone. You just, you're winning races, you're at home. And then just doing what you normally do. And then coach tells you, okay, next next month, we're going to go to Spain for two months. I was like, I don't want to leave my dogs, my, my girlfriend, you know, my home for two months. It's like, and uh but it's, it's like, hey man, you, you gotta do it. I mean, we're gonna we need to get you back on track, and we don't want to get you ready for the season. And you know, we got we want to win some races. We have these these you know all these goals, and and I was like, okay, let's do it. And even at a training camp, I mean, it, the beginning the beginning of the season, it's always the toughest. It always was the toughest toughest part for me, and because. Uh, we always used to we always used to put a lot of work on the road rides before the season. You know, just do a lot of not a lot, but you know, depending on which season. But we did a lot of some road riding, and then then you do a you know some gym stuff, and then you get back on the bike. And at first, you know, you feel a little sluggish and slow. You know, it's just not. And you, and then it, it creeps in. And always before the season, it's like the first race is always tough because you just you just slow. <laughs> you know, you just, it's just and then you always think is like all this work i mean what if i mean what if i stay this slow you know but it always comes back i mean i always say that you need that one race to kind of get yourself going really i mean even even though you struggle the first race i mean the second race is going to be probably 20 30 percent better you're going to feel way better than the first race you just kind of need to get that one out the first one out of the way and uh and over the years i kind of learned to understand that because uh even 2014, I remember we went to the Manchester indoor race before the season. And obviously, I raced with Liam there, and Liam is pretty much unstoppable there, right? And it just, it just killed me. I mean, it literally, I mean, even though I got second, I, I couldn't even keep up with him on the track. I mean, that's how, that's how fast it was going. And, and I was like, Phew. I mean, I mean, that was, that was embarrassing, you know? I was like, <laughs> that was pretty bad. But then, I mean, Couple of weeks later, I came back to America. I won. I think I won the Oldsmar. You know, I won the first national, and then I went back. I won the Germany. You know, from whatever lane six, Holstein. I mean, one of the good races. I won Argentina that year, and then I won a lot of races. So it just, it always, but it reminded me, just gotta gotta stick to the plan. You gotta stay with the plan and trust your coach, and then, you know, it's gonna turn around eventually. I mean, and then. If you don't trust your coach and you don't trust your training program, then it's 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 not gonna work out. Yeah, it's not gonna work that way. And then, and that's over the years, I I learned to understand the better and better each year. That I mean, you gotta trust the plan. Yeah, if you don't trust the plan, then it's 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 just pointless. Yeah, it's just it's not gonna work out. In that one interview you gave when you retired. Um, what is what was the exact reason you retired? Um, for someone who's not in the BMX scene, uh, it wasn't very clear. Could you just give a rough outline why you retired? Uh, well, I lost the uh, the fun on the bike. Really, I mean, uh, and it all really started two thousand and seventeen mid season, and 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 um, to be honest, and. Uh, uh it's just it's just how you know because you when you race you're supposed to race with uh like a little bit of freedom with uh, excitement joy it has to you have to be you have to enjoy being in those moments putting yourself in the you know getting in the gate and just getting ready for the race and just racing the best guys in the world and then and that year almost became like uh 
like a chore. I mean, it felt like freaking, uh, it felt like hard work. It's just something I wasn't hmm. enjoying. It felt like, you know, I'm, I'm being forced to be out. That's how I felt like I'm being forced to be out there, you know, like, and, uh, and at that point it's like, even the world championships, I mean, in Rock Hill, I mean, cause deep down, I mean, going into that race, I kind of, I knew this could be the last, this could be the last race. I mean, it could be the last big race of, uh, of my career. And, uh, and I was actually, I mean, I was, I was going fast. I mean, I was feeling good at the practice times. We, we obviously we timed some of the first straightaways. I was going good. It's just the, I think the one, a final is just a bad lane choice or whatever. And then obviously Tori made a good move and just really a bad luck. Cause I was, I was feeling good. I, I thought maybe I can, I can pull it off and, go out with the bang, you know, in the low paddle, but, uh, but, uh, after the race, yeah, I just, I just kind of knew it. this, this probably going to be my last big race. Yeah. And, uh, but I didn't want to announce anything till I was hundred percent sure. I didn't want the decision to be based on emotions right after the race, mm -hmm. but, uh, that's why I took some time off and, uh, I still, I trained a little bit. Obviously, I went to the gym. I, you know, I did some sprints, but I, the training routine and re, it wasn't as as strict as it was obviously previous years. But I kind of kept myself in shape. If I decide to continue that way, it would maybe I would need two three months to get back to where I was, where I need to be. And um, but yeah, just. After after a while, I mean, and especially after the son was born, it just kind of kind of hit me that you know it's just maybe it's time. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it's not really because the the, the son was born, but uh, but it's just at that point, it's just I kind of realized, you know, maybe you know, I think this is it, and I'm happy where I'm at in life. And then then like I always say, I mean, people always ask me why I name my my son Rio. I mean, that's that's my that was my third missing goal. That I was missing that I didn't win in Brazil and uh, and that, right I think after I got that one I mean that's you know my career was complete and then that's how I look at it and uh, yeah it was definitely a tough decision and then and also it, what he also came down to was uh, I mean because uh, the industry is kind of was suffering and struggling a little bit and then free agent left as a sponsor I mean I mean, they're still a little bit involved in the racing, but uh, just the money wasn't the same. Yeah, I did, there's really not much, not many good sponsors in the United States. I mean, uh, back in the days, it was you know it was definitely better, and that and, it, and that kind of and that kind of hit me as well. I mean, kind of made me realize that you know it's just at this age. I mean, I'll be 31, 32, 33. Do I want to race? go out there and then take those risks if i can make good enough money doing that you know I, you know and then i realized i don't have even though i love the sport but i don't have that much love and passion for the sport to put myself in risk for you know for the money that just didn't make much sense yeah really i mean uh and that's what it really came down to i mean at the end of the day i think that was one of the the main reason, yeah, I think, I mean, even coach, coach asked me, it's like, I mean, he wanted me to obviously stay in, stay in the BMX and go for Tokyo and then hmm. try to do it again. But uh, I told him, it's just, the money has to be right. You know, the money has to be right. And if the money is not good enough for, you know, it gives me that little extra motivation, you know, the, the, then I just, I can't do this. Yeah. I mean, this is, I gave it all I had and then, you know, to do at age 33 to do BMX and put yourself in in those risky situations just because you love the sport, it just, just wasn't the right thing to do. Yeah. Who is your role model? Role model? Uh, hmm. Well, probably coach. I mean, obviously, growing up, it was always uh, as a kid, you know, you look in all the BMX magazines, it was Benny Nelson. The BMX race on on a, on a po power light team and uh, power light and uh, but later on it was I think it was the Ivo Ivo Lacuccia as a kid I mean he was he was kind of the fastest guy in Latvia that he was going to the 
the Europe he's racing all the big guys and you know as a kid the 13 14 you always look up to him he's like you know it would be so cool to be coached by him and and he was basically I was someone and then you know I get I get I had a chance to be coached by him and that was really a dream come through I mean at first and then and, and then it turned into a good relationship and then he started coaching I mean coaching me full time and then even he was coaching me when I well he was still racing I mean that was I mean that I mean looking back that's tough to do I mean that's tough to do obviously I was he was even though he was coaching obviously mostly himself and we were doing the same stuff he was doing but uh I mean that's still tough to do because we were upcoming kids and then we we, we were getting closer and closer to the point where you know I started I started beating him started winning him in practices and gates and races and and his approach never changed. You know, he always, he was always there to help me. I mean, coach me and then train me and all that stuff. So I mean, that's, I mean, look, I mean, for an athlete, that's impressive. I mean, it, that's tough to do, especially when younger kids come up and they start beating you. A lot of times, you're just like, okay, this is it. You gotta, you gotta do your own thing. But uh, he was always cool, and he took me, he took me under the wing, uh, you know, under his wing, and then, and uh, we kept working. I mean, all the way till my end of my career. You know, it, it never changed, and uh, so I mean, that was that was pretty uh, that was pretty cool. So I would say probably, I mean, growing up as a kid, he was definitely the the biggest role model. That was the guy you always wanted to be coached by. That was mm. that was that was it. Yeah. Mm, cool. What's the best advice you received, and who gave it to you? Best advice. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I gotta think. I don't know. Uh, best advice. Yeah, I got it. There have been so many like those uh, little timely things that have been said. I mean, that were said. I mean, even during the races or maybe before the races or when I struggle, but I, I can't quite point, you know, pinpoint one thing and kind of remember exact words but uh yeah i'm sure if i thought of for a bit longer i mean maybe i would recall something but uh yeah I don't, you know I've always been a very self motivated guy it was never it was it was really you know there was never an issue where i had to feel like you know the people have to come in and motivate me and then tell me all these things and all that stuff and then I always knew I can figure this out on my own. Yeah, that's that's how I that's how that's how I always felt, and that's how I was think that's how I was raised, and then that's how I grew up thinking, and then it kind of translated in my later in my career as well. And then, uh, yeah, just really, I mean, there's always whatever there whatever happened or whatever was going on, I knew I can figure this thing out myself, if not myself, then with the help of my coach. That's how I always felt. Anything related to BMX, I knew that me and my coach, whatever it is, we're gonna figure this out. Yeah, that's how confident I was. And then, and it was just really, I mean, it was just me and him. Yeah, and obviously without that, some of my good friends. I mean, uh, Richard Zvidi and Christoph Konrad, so they you know used to race BMX as well. And then, obviously, they have helped me a lot as well. I mean, just with the, just training with me, and then then. You know all that stuff just keeping it fun and everything all that stuff but uh as far as the advice yeah i just yeah it was never you know it was it was never an issue yeah i need mean, just i knew where i want to get i knew what i need it needs to be done i knew you know the coach is the guy i have to listen to and then the, we me and him together we can we can get there that's just how i always approached it yeah mm, cool And then back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? Typical training day back in the day? Uh, uh, well, let's do I mean, you know, we, every year we always try to mix it up and change it. You know, there were days when years when we did gym in the morning and then maybe the, the years later we try to switch it up and do it in the evening just to, you know, just to really switch it up and kind of see how the body feels and reacts and all that stuff. But, uh, But uh, yeah, just to wake up at eight o'clock. I mean, 
oatmeal. Let's just say you eat oatmeal. I used to eat a lot of oatmeal because it's it's light. It fills you up, and it it, it doesn't. You don't get hungry that quick, yeah. But it, it keeps you full. I mean, and obviously a coffee in the morning. <laughs> the athletes <laughs> love coffee, and uh, yeah, I mean, you just and then you just get ready go to. Usually, I mean, let's say, I mean, I have a gym in the morning, and uh, gym. I mean, it really depends. I mean, we have to lift heavy. I mean, some gym sessions were you know three three hours long, three twenty even sometimes, you know, but. Uh, but during the season, you just go maybe two hours, two twenty. You don't go longer than that. And then since I was a lot of times kind of by myself, I mean, you know, it, I wouldn't say it took longer, but you know, you just kind of get lost in the moment a little bit. You're in the gym by yourself. You just kind of float around, and then the gym session instead of two hours ended up being like two twenty. You know, just a bit longer than they they, they should have been. But uh, and, uh, and then yeah, obviously as I get older, I paid a lot more attention to stretching. I mean, which a lot of guys don't really do, but uh, I always tell them. I mean, either you start now, or you're gonna, or you're gonna suffer later, because it's just it's one of those things. You, I wasn't doing it either, man, because I was young. I didn't need it. I was. I just wanted to race. I mean, race, lift, race. I mean, maybe stretch. I mean, a couple times a month. But uh, as I get older, I mean, the, the stretching really helped, though. I mean, my my just the way I feel, my lower back. I mean, everything, and then. It just kept me nice and loose. I mean, and, and then throw them. I mean, just b felt better on my bike. And uh, how often would you do it? And just give us a rough outline: daily, how many minutes, or how many times a week? What are we talking about? Oh, uh, the training. Oh, uh, the stretching. If we well, would have to give it to yeah. younger athletes now, so. Yeah, the stretching. I would say I, I pretty much I did it once a day. I did it once a day, and then. You know, obviously, on days off, I didn't stretch. I mostly st always stretch after the gym session. You know, when you when you when you lift all the all the weights and on your back and all that stuff. And uh, and after track sessions too, I started stretching after all the track sessions. And uh, the sprints, uh, a lot of times I did. The sprints were like 50-50. I did stretch after sprints, it, depending how I feel, what kind of sprints I had. If I had the sprints from dead stuff, I would probably stretch. If I had sprints from like, when you're going, then I just I. I didn't feel like I, you know, needed to stretch that much, and then maybe instead of stretching, I, 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 I just switched it to like ice bath or you know cryo or something, you know. Hmm. But uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, the stretching is just one of those things. I just it was I had to. That had to become my routine, you know. Later in my career, when I was in, when I was younger, it was just it was just I was okay once in a while when I feel like it, you know. Then uh, that kind of changed, but uh, but yeah, training and then obviously you go like I said, you go to gym and you come home, you rest, you, you maybe run some errands, go to the bank or you know whatever whatever you have to do. But most of the most part, you just try to rest because you know even you have another either sprints or track, I and mean, you always want to make sure your your body your body and your mind is just you know recovered enough that way you can go and give it hundred percent because uh, you don't want to you don't want to show up at the track when you just just. Physic physically, you might be tired, but when you just kind of mentally a little sluggish, and you just can't quite get there mentally, process the information quick enough. That's how injuries happen a lot of times. That's so why you got to be careful and really pay attention to the, the recovery part of the recovery part of you know the the, 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 the that process and the, and that 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 part that that stuff I realize as I get older too. I mean. You know the kids; they just they just naturally recover. They are they always full of energy. But as you get older, you just gotta you just gotta time things the right way, and then plan your training schedule the right way. And then and sometimes if you overdo it, over over train, and then you really I mean you have these sprints in the evening that you feel like your body is just you a little stiff. It's just you don't think you can handle. Then you know then you gotta switch up the the training program a little bit and just kind of listen to your body a little more as you get older. Really, that's just kind of what changed. But uh, other than that, it was it was just stick to the stick to the plan. Mm, cool. What's up next for the machine? What's up in your life? So you're uh, giving but, your knowledge uh, and experience to others. Yeah, I'm in a, Well, I'm not. The, the coaching is really not something that I see myself doing full time. But uh, I'm doing yeah some uh, training clinics here and there and then all over the world. To switch it up and but it's mostly i mean just to traveling to different places and meeting uh the young upcoming kids 
and just kind of passing them on some of the stuff that I've learned over the years and then just kind of hanging out with the, all the, the younger generation and giving, giving them that, that extra motivation and extra boost, you know, just, just keep it, just to keep going and then, then just do what they're doing really. I mean, that's what it's really all about. It's not because, you know, the training clinics you do two, three hours. I mean, obviously it's one session. There's, there's a limited amount, you know, of time that, you know, I, I can spend with those kids and there's not, I can only teach them so many things in you know in two two and a half hours, but uh, but it's really all about giving them that direction. I mean, talking to kids and then just just giving the, giving them that extra boost, the motivation, really, just to just to keep it up, keep going, and then and then that's really what it's all about. Because I mean, looking back on my career, I never really had that. I mean, you know, and I think the kids have the great these days it's a great opportunity to be coached and then be shown different things by, you know, the professional athletes, the good athletes of BMX racing. So, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's, it's awesome for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. And that's really giving back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, cool. But it, you know, I'm doing it once in a while. It's, it's not a, it's not a full-time thing or, you know, or stuff like that. I'm just really doing it once in a while, once in, you know, every other month just to kind of keep it fun and, plan some trips and then stuff like that, but it's not something I do like every week and then stuff like that. Hmm. Cool. Bonus question. Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Uh, do I have to nominate someone? Uh, it can be anyone. It's up to you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you probably, how many have you done? Have you done a lot of athletes already? I saw you did one with Yelly. Oh, yeah. I mean, BMX, we're pretty much sorted now. So we have, uh, now we have you, we had uh, Sam Willoughby. Yeah. We had the whole Dutch crew, Raymond, Nick, Yelle. So that's... Get the, you get a lot of them, yeah. Yeah. Well... I Mariana, we have Mariana. Oh, you get all the big ones. You get all the big ones. Well, Anise is next up. I haven't spoken to her yet, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, you should, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I would love to see, uh, it'll be funny, though, but uh, my buddy, Richard Zvidi, later. <laughs> the interview, he's not, yeah, he's out of racing to himself. He's not racing anymore, but, uh, you know, and then, so that would be fun. Or maybe, I mean, I don't know, one of the coaches, but I don't think my coach would, uh, he, he, he don't like all the social media stuff in interviews, so I don't think he would sign up for this. So that's why I can't really no nominate my coach. <laughs> You have but, to convince uh, him. <laughs> yeah, I would have to. I would, we would have to do some convincing with him. Yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, I think that's that would be my nominee, really. And uh, and obviously, there's, there's so many athletes you can you know you can do. I mean, Joys and 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 and, and, and all all them guys. I mean, as well. But uh, I think you know, just to switch it up would be good too. Or maybe Tremonis, you know, someone that. Uh, you know, just kind of been around for long enough and then just kind of have seen it all and they kind of retired. And I think once you retire, you can really talk about these things a lot more clearer and better hmm. once you kind of away from the sport. And then, because once you, because well, while you're still racing, you don't really see a lot of things the way you see when you're done racing. Yeah. You know, and then that kind of, that that's, that's just at least how I personally feel. And then, That's why I think one those guys would be good as well. Someone that's been in BMX but maybe not racing at the moment anymore. So yeah, that would be my nominee. I'll let, I'll let you pick one yourself. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Where can people find you? Where they can find me? They can find me. Well, Facebook. I don't really use Facebook that much, but uh, probably Instagram would be probably the best. That Mary Strombergs. And then if they have any questions or anything, they can always yeah, send me a message. And that's really probably the only one I still kind of check these days. And obviously, I email emails always. Yeah, I'm always uh, available through emails. But uh, but probably the best one, yeah, Instagram. Instagram. And your website is Strombergs81? No, the website com? is Strombergs.com. But uh, okay. I haven't updated the website in a in a while and then because I'm still I'm in that stage right now where I'm trying to kind of figure out what direction I want to go to after my BMX career so I'm just kind of 
kind of like I wouldn't say all over the place, but just I don't really know, you know, what I want to what I want to do next, and then so just kind of in that stage or trying to figure it out. So everything's kind of everything's kind of on hold right now, you know, the yeah. website and all that stuff. So, but we'll see, we'll see. I'll stick around. I'll stick around. Yeah, Maris, thanks so much for your time. That was great. Thank you, thank you, thanks for having me. Thanks. Until next time. Thank you. We'll catch up soon again. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good one.